may you forever be well. That's how our chants end every, every evening. That chant doesn't come from the Pali Canon, doesn't come from the Buddha, it comes from later centuries. When monks are trying to figure out what kind of chants their sponsor would like to hear. And there would be sponsors who would have the monks come and chant that in hopes that somehow the power of the chant would make them well, keep them well, protect them. In fact, it's one of the great ironies of the Buddhist chanting tradition. There's the Mangala Sutta where the Buddha talks about the various blessings that give you protection, and none of them having, have anything to do with chants. They all come from the good things that you do. It's important to keep that in mind, that that's our protection. We live in a world where there's a lot of anxiety. We tend to blame it now on the internet, but think about the old days when news was really hard to come by. It doesn't mean there was a big blank there in people's minds. They filled it up with all kinds of rumors. Imagine being a French peasant during the Revolution and all the different rumors that would go coursing through France. People were strung up, killed, because a rumor had come to a group of peasants that a certain class of people had done this or done that. And if you happen to fall into that class of people and you happen to go to one of those villages, they'd string you up. Life has always been very uncertain. As the Buddha said, birth is suffering. You get this human body, and it leaves you exposed to all kinds of things. You start out totally helpless. If it weren't for the help of other people, your parents or whoever raised you, you would have died very, very quickly. It's because we have people looking after us that we're able to survive, and gradually we're able to take care of some of our needs by ourselves. But there's a lot that's totally beyond our control. When the Buddha talks about the drawbacks of having a body, he lists the different diseases that the body is subject to. And it seems like every part of the body has its own disease, if not more than one disease. And then on top of that, just, as the texts say, once you have a body, you're exposed to arrows and sticks and stones and all kinds of weapons. You leave yourself exposed to all kinds of dangers. So it's no wonder that the anxious, nagging voices in our mind have a lot of authority. Because it's true, there are a lot of dangers out there. And in a lot of ways you can never do enough to prevent each danger that could happen. But the Buddha does give us protection in his teachings. And the quality he wants us to develop is one of confidence. Think of the image of the hindrance of restlessness and anxiety, wind blowing over water. If you look, try to look into the water to see your reflection, you can't see it because the, the ripples are so, so many, moving so fast. But the quality of basada is like a clear, calm lake. And it's often said that people listening to the Buddha's Dharma would gain that sense of confidence, even though the Buddha didn't say, may you forever be well. But he gave them a perspective on things. Pointing out that the present moment is not totally a new moment, unprecedented. Every present moment has a pattern. They're going to be Influences coming in from your past karma that you can't do anything about. But then there are going to be the things you can do with your present karma. And those are the things that are going to make the difference between whether you suffer or not. And that's what we're training in. This is where we bring in the quality of what the Buddha calls appropriate attention. We look at what's happening in the mind. And if something unskillful is coming up, you know what to do with it. It should be abandoned. Something skillful is coming up, you develop it. And then you develop that principle even further, and it turns into the Four Noble Truths and their duties. 
like we chatted just now. Stress is to be comprehended. Its cause is to be abandoned. Its cessation is to be realized, and the path of the cessation is to be developed. And how do you do that? You develop qualities of ardency, alertness, mindfulness. These things will always stand you in good stead. You develop discernment. You develop goodwill and compassion. These things are always useful. So no matter what the particular danger, or what the particular unexpected event that comes up, you've got a series of tools that will be useful in all situations. Mindfulness helps to remember whatever lessons you've learned from the past. It goes together with concentration. You try to calm the mind, because when the mind is full of worry and anxiety, you basically turn off or block off a lot of the things that would be helpful. You suddenly can't remember the good lessons from the past. And John Lee's images of the ocean. When the ocean is flat, you can see far distances. When there are a lot of waves, you're down in the trough, you can't see very far at all. So when your mind is full of waves like that, you're not going to be able to remember anything much. So you've got to calm the mind down. And then you can see far distances. You can remember things that you learned a long time ago. And those will come in and help you. And then you're alert to what you're doing. You realize that there may be a lot of things in this situation that are beyond your control. But you can control what choices you're making right now. So you focus there. And you look very carefully at what you're doing to make sure that it is skillful. And if it's not, then you bring in the quality of ardency. You try to do it well. All of this is based on goodwill for yourself, goodwill for the, all the beings around you. And the discernment that allows you to see what will be the most helpful ways of thinking at any one time. So no matter what the potential dangers there are out there, you have some tools, you have some skills that can be applied in any situation. And so when anxious thoughts come up, and they will, as I said, given the fact that you have a body, there's a lot to be anxious about if you're concerned about its survival. But if you can remember that the survival of your goodness is more important, that allows you to become calmer in the face of dangers. Because your goodness is something you can protect. Nobody can destroy your goodness aside from you. They can harm your body. But they can't force you to do things that are unskillful. Now they will threaten punishments and sometimes inflict punishments if you don't, don't do what they want. But if you decide, okay, I'm not going to do anything unskillful at all, and you're ready to face whatever the consequences are, confident in the fact that you're maintaining your most valuable possession. That confidence can help overcome a lot of your anxiety. So in any case, confidence, self-esteem, they have to be based on skills. This is what we're developing as we meditate, learning how to step aside when anxious thoughts come in, not let them take over, if they're going to be there in the mind. And no matter how much you try to think straight about them, that they're still nagging away at you, you just tell them, okay, you can have part of the mind, but you can't have the whole mind. Stay with the part that is calm, is collected, is confident. And protect that, and then the influence of that still water will begin to spread. So 
that whatever dangers there are. You remember the real dangers are in the possibility that you might do something unskillful. And if you can be confident that you would not ever do that, then you're safe. The body will do its body thing. After all, once you're born, as the Buddha said, aging is inevitable. Illness is inevitable. Death is inevitable. But losing your right view, losing your virtue is not inevitable. You would have to choose to lose them. But when you're confident that you wouldn't, then you're really safe. And that confidence can give you a good foundation. So at the very least, that much of your mind can be like a clear, calm lake. That doesn't get whipped up by the storms.